Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's presentation entitled Security versus Development, the SDLC's Game of Thrones. My name is Marie Peters, and I'll be moderating today's session. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Representing the Security House is Nabil Hanan. Nabil is a managing principal at Sigital and is a 10-year application security veteran with extensive experience performing penetration tests, code review, threat modeling, and architecture risk analysis. Representing the Development House is Ian Spiro. Ian is Codescope's Director of Security Strategy and Research. Prior to joining Codescope, Ian spent the better part of eight years at Alps Labs and IBM developing solutions for security teams. Thanks, Marie. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. Okay, fantastic. So, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining and listening to us today. Uh, my name is Nabil Hanan. I work as the managing principal for Sigital, and I oversee all of Sigital's uh, business and operations in the Northeast USA as well as Eastern Canada. So today, um, I'm going to be playing the role of the security professional, and um, ultimately, as someone in the security space, my goal is to help businesses and organizations um, identify potential security issues that are in their software um, and help them to make their businesses more secure and understand what type of risk exposure they have. Um, I truly believe that this can, can happen effectively by building security into the software from the get-go instead of using security as an afterthought. And from weapons perspective, um, there are multiple techniques we can use to identify security risk, things like static analysis, uh, code review, dynamic analysis and pen testing, training, architecture analysis, and so on. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about today. Hi all, uh, my name is Ian Spiro. I'm the Director of Security Strategy and Research at Codescope. Uh, I've been working in static analysis tooling space for um, the majority of uh, 10 years and um, right now I'm working on building a next generation static analysis tool. Uh, I'm representing development in my role today and as a development lead, I'm very wary of security um, picking the tools that they believe are correct for my development environment, and especially um, uh, the reactive security point of view where after I think everybody is done with their functional requirements, I get a list of bugs that now are the highest priority and need to be fixed immediately. Um, my development teams have their IDEs, their um, unit testing frameworks, and uh, all of our automated tests uh, already picked out and everything works fine until security comes and gives us new requirements late in the life cycle. Um, I'm hoping that we can uh, have a, a clean battle today. So thanks. On the topic of battle, we know that there are many things that tend to lead up to war. So we'd like to hear from both of you about the things that you see that tend to cause conflict between the two sides. So the first thing up that looks like we have is security responsibility. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, if we look at security, ultimately it's the security teams that are there to do a lot of the heavy lifting around activities that identify security issues and try to build software um, securely. And ultimately what has to happen is there needs to be some type of a top-down corporate or company-wide effort uh, to make this successful. And this obviously requires investment in people, uh, committing resources and allocating resources to do the, do the work. And of course, it needs to be done proactively instead of reactively. We tend to find a lot of organizations um, are always in a reactive mode when it comes to security, especially they tend to focus on it after some type of an incident has happened. But um, I think if in the long run, companies need to start thinking about how to get to that proactive mode um, to think about software security as part of the whole software security, de uh, software development life cycle instead of it being an afterthought after the software has already been built. Um, that being said, um, you know, reactive security is better than nothing. So even though that's where we are now, we need to start um, thinking of how to get to a more proactive approach. Uh, so I would completely agree that uh, security is everyone's responsibility. It needs to be um, 
designed in from having the proper requirements at the beginning of, of the process to the testing frameworks that are necessary to find and fix these uh, things that we all agree we want to keep out of our code. Uh, what I would counter with, though, is that if security is truly a business priority, then it's mandated that your security teams give us the appropriate tools to accomplish the job, and probably even more importantly, training to use these tools. Not just training around secure code practices, but specific training in how we should be using the tools that are supposed to help us automate this job. Um, I agree reactive security isn't where we want to be. In fact, it's really a killer for the development processes that my team has in place. Um, there's really nothing worse than getting a list of a thousand bugs that haven't been vetted from the security champions and told that even though we've done what we believed was our job, getting the functional requirements up and running, now we have another set of high priority items that need to be fixed immediately uh, before we can say we're finished with development. So I think that kind of brings us to an interesting topic around the tool deployment and how to use um, tools effectively as, as part of an organization. Ultimately, there are tools out there that help with finding software security issues, but as we understand with different types of tools, um, they tend to be noisy and of course you can't expect the dev organization to understand how to use the results and even how to use the tools effectively because they tend to be very complicated. So ignoring the security aspect uh, of things and ignoring the the requirements coming down for security is not the answer in this case either. Um, ultimately, you know, tools need to be deployed so that they can work um, with the development organization and the development efforts and create as minimal friction as possible. So, you know, and a great example would be something like Codescope Secure Assist, which is an IDE plugin that helps developers find and fix and ultimately prevent vulnerabilities from the get-go because it's identifying um, vulnerabilities as part of the regular development process without needing to go through any separate workflow and also not, focus, not inundating developers with thousands and thousands of issues. Um, you know, I think it was uh, Jim Routh, um, the CISO of Aetna, who in a recent webinar said that if you can integrate static analysis tools into the development lifecycle to work in tandem with the developer's regular workflow, uh, that organizations can see 15 to 20 percent a year over year productivity gain uh, because, of the, because of that effort and the process and development leveraging the tools effectively. So what are your thoughts on that, Ian? I would agree that a uh, proper choice of tooling is crucial to enabling a proper conversation to happen between security and dev. Um, my experience and my team's experience using static analysis tools is that they're really riddled with false positives. They take too much time for my team to investigate what may likely be um, a miscommunication or misunderstanding of the programming languages and the frameworks that I'm using. And after all is said and done, once you've hunted down a number of false positives, uh, you really lose confidence in, in the use of the tool in general. Um, it seems like, although I agree, Codescope Secure Assist is very nice because it you know, scans files as I'm opening things. Anytime I make what I think is a fix and save the file, it rescans to let me know that I have you know, done things correctly or again incorrectly. Um, but I find that the lack of framework understanding in static analysis tools is really a killer. Um, I can't tell you how many times security has come uh, to my team and said, you need to be doing input validation. We don't see you're using any framework uh, level controls, but they simply don't understand how the interceptor stack works in Spring MVC. And what they're asking for is simply found in configuration files, not in the code itself. Um, that's just indicative of the way that frameworks have really become a crucial tool for my development team and something that it just seems like static analysis vendors in general um, haven't given credence or maybe they just don't have the technologies to fully understand how these frameworks affect the data coming into, into my applications. 
Um, so false positives are a real uh, issue for my team. And I wish that security could, you know, set up some kind of filtering mechanism so that nothing is ever brought to our attention as needing to be fixed immediately when in fact it doesn't need to be fixed. The fix is already there or it's simply a misunderstanding of the tool or the security team running the tools. Uh, on the other side of the house, uh, I really like the dynamic analysis results that your team comes with because they're proof positive. I can see that there's definitely an exploit for this vulnerability, but conversely, I don't know where to fix it, right? You give me a URL and you give me a payload, but that says nothing about where in the code I should be making this fix to one, mitigate the existing vulnerability, but even more important for my team is to understand how to securely code in this language and this framework moving forward. That's what I'm really interested in, in getting is a tool that one, understands my choice of programming languages, my specific frameworks, and, and two, can actually teach me to become a better programmer. It yeah. seems like training is one of the missing bridges between our teams right now. Yeah, that, that brings up a great point, actually. So, I mean, um, ultimately, you're correct. You know, the static analysis tools that are available right now in the market, they do a pretty poor job of understanding framework usage. But also, conversely, the pen testing side of things, you get real exploits, but you don't know where to go track the issues down. Um, ultimately, the way to, to do this work is you really have to have security involved in the development process from even the whiteboarding sessions before any code has been written. Because ultimately what happens is, um, especially with tool deployments like static analysis, you can get very effective results if you can fine tune and write some custom rules for the static analysis tools so that now the tool will actually understand what frameworks you're using or it will have the ability to understand any custom developed code that you have that's taking care of a specific security control like input validation or output encoding. And once you can integrate and have security involved in the software development process from the requirements and the white requirements phase when you're whiteboarding and designing your system, um, security can actually build those rules into the static analysis engine. So not only are you getting good quality results from the pen test with issues that are truly exploitable, but you're also getting the deeper internal look at the code level to understand where you need to go and address those issues, and you can have confidence that these issues are true positives. Um, additionally, you also need to have expertise and, and security experts to review the results of static analysis code, uh, code, res code review results to ensure that the false positives get vetted and removed uh, because that is a common problem. And um, you do need a certain level of expertise to be able to do that effectively and quickly, which to be honest, most developers don't have because they're not necessarily thinking from the security perspective. They're more focused on implementing the functionality that are part of their requirements that they have to go and implement. So that definitely makes sense, and I think there are approaches that can be taken. Um, as I said, this again involves resources and time uh, that has to be put in, and security needs to become a more of a proactive approach. Just to counter, I absolutely agree in, in the notion of building security in from the beginning and having your team involved in, you know, the user story creation and at the beginning of our sprints is crucial to ensuring that we're on track to building secure software. But I still find that um, just giving us a list of things to avoid doesn't equate to actual requirements. Uh, it's really hard to prove the absence of a vulnerability. And what I really need from your team is for you guys, you understand security, you have programming expertise as well. I, I want you guys to do the hardcore security research to say, not only do you need to avoid cross-site scripting and SQL injection, but hey, we understand you're working on a new Node.js application. 
what we recommend is that you use, we've done the research, you should use the HAPPY framework for your routing, for your HTTP routing. We want you to use the bcrypt plugin for that framework whenever you're hashing passwords. And we really, you know, promote the use of Angular on your client side, view technology, because this way, you know, we can be pretty confident that everything is uh, contextually output um, in, in proper encoding standards. So rather than a list of things to avoid, I would really like it if the security team could do the research and come to the table at the beginning of Sprint saying, this is what we recommend you use, and this will ensure that we're both moving down the same path together. Yeah, so that's a great point. I think that brings us to the next catalyst that we had, which is around communication. And, you know, I tend to agree that all those challenges are very real, and, and most development organizations face those challenges right now because security comes back with a list of things not to do. Um, I think it's important that at the requirements phase, um, building the right software security requirements can be challenging. And avoiding things like, you know, avoid OWASP top 10 or avoid SANS top 25 is not sufficient. So ultimately, we need to think about writing requirements that make sense for the system that you're building. And that's where we need to have requirements that say things like, all input coming in from an external untrusted source needs to be validated using this framework A. And then all output needs to be output encoded based on the context using framework B feature one, um, and so on. And that can only happen if the lines of communication are open between development and security. And I think we're reaching a point where people are understanding the importance of security, but they need to embrace that the security teams are here to help build better software and not to create more roadblocks um, for developers. So as part of that, I think what really organizations need to start focusing on, and I've seen this happen at other organizations, is building out a software security framework where they actually put together a list of approved frameworks that will help you build certain software security controls into your software. And that also helps when we go back to the static analysis phase, is now we can actually test defined misuse or non-existent use of those frameworks. And if they're not being used correctly, we can have the standards that are part of the framework that we can give to the development organization and say, look, we gave you these things to help you build the software and the system more securely. You need to be using them, and here are some areas where you might have missed it because we can train the static analysis tools to look for usage of those specific things, which I think is important and will make lives easier for both the development teams and the security teams. Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds fantastic. If, if you could actually, you know, come with suggestions of appropriate choices of frameworks and language-specific libraries that you, your team has vetted and you suggest that we use, uh, that would not only give us confidence that you actually know what we're developing, um, not just from a functional standpoint, but actually the details of the programming language being used, and would, would create a, a lot more goodwill and certainly confidence within my team that security is here to make our software better in general. This is just one part of quality. And if, if we actually had tools that, first of all, understood dynamic languages like JavaScript, like um, you know, Python, Perl, Ruby, all the stuff that my team is using, and then could give us not just uh, negative feedback where, we, where we've clearly been uh, misusing the framework or um, uh, left out security controls entirely, but some kind of positive reinforcement mechanism that in addition to training can show my team um, without just passing your test that, oh, we've actually been learning some new secure coding practices and put those practices in place, I would like some positive feedback mechanisms besides just the lack of, of a list of vulnerabilities at the end of development to show uh, my team and also management that this is a worthy investment and that our time spent using these tools and taking these trainings actually makes us better overall developers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, definitely agree with you on that. I think a common mistake that people make 
are they hire people to come and break their software, and those people tend to be security professionals that are coming in, but they don't necessarily know how software is truly built um, or even understand the programming languages or have never really written code. Uh, we, have, we see out there a lot of security professionals who are great at using different tools and open source items to break into software, but they don't necessarily know how to go and fix it and how to speak to developers and help them understand and give them that positive reinforcement on things that they're doing well and things that could be improved on. Um, so I think we see a lack of that both in the tool space because tools aren't proactively helping you understand areas where you've done well, but even security professionals um, tend to be very good at breaking things but don't necessarily speak the same language as software developers. Uh, that's something actually that I pride in my own teams here is that, you know, we only have people who come from a development background and they really know how software gets built uh, and understand the challenges that developers have so we don't create a lot of friction when we interact with developers. But Ultimately, that also makes them better at breaking the software because they know how it was originally built um, and also helps them speak the same language with the development teams to help them understand that we appreciate the challenges they have and their focus on building the right functionality, but we can also give them tools and, and frameworks and code snippets, et cetera, that help them do the remediation of the vulnerabilities that have been found and, and do them more effectively than they would have if left on their own means. Yeah, I mean, that, that's um, one of my ongoing uh, issues with dealing with security folk up in their ivory towers is that um, we're not speaking the same language more often than not. Um, especially if you bring in a pen tester at the end to break my stuff, uh, there's already a bit of animosity because you're trying to destroy the <laughs> yeah. stuff I just created. But then just telling me, yeah, this is broken, go fix it, uh, just makes my team want to, you know, break your security process by coding around your tools, right? <laughs> or, so, or proactively fixing things as I'm finding things. Right, so, right. <laughs> <laughs> that has happened. And, and what would be ideal is that if if I know that you, your team actually understands the programming language and the ins and outs of, of my day-to-day -day job, then I think I would actually find more of my team members leaning on your resources to provide solutions for problems that haven't come up yet. Um, not only being invited to the beginning of the sprints, but having an ongoing conversation as we build more and more complicated functionality to say, hey, it looks like we're venturing into this area. Do you have any suggestions for the best way to go about this? Or have you, have you seen some of the hot new frameworks that tackle this stuff for me? Um, and, and then, you know, one thing that we've mentioned several times but just doesn't seem to have permeated the, the business culture is that my team needs training. It can't just be as I'm using security tools and I find there's a vulnerability, I go to Stack Overflow and I Google it and I try and find the fix for it. Like I would like, you know, time, resources, and um, dedication from the company side to say secure coding matters to us. That's why the first couple days of every month, everybody in my team is invited to go and take a secure coding course. Or the people that are interested in crypto, well, you know, every quarter there's at least one trip to a security conference focused on crypto where you can learn uh, the cutting edge of, of new technologies out there. Because if, if this is really going to be um, uh, an investigation or an adventure that we go on together to learn how to build the best possible software, then I need to know not only your team can be leaned on as a resource, but my management is behind this, not just saying they are, but putting the financial backing that, that I need for my team to become a better, you know, a, a group of better developers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And I think um, the reasoning you gave for why we need more training and, and so on, it's, it's important. But there's also some additional things, you know, we, we kind of understand that there are common conflicts um, that we kind of brought up earlier that, that kind of creates roadblock and 
makes everyone do more reactive things versus proactive things um, as part of their development process. But, you know, if we want to kind of figure out ways we can maintain the peace um, between the two groups, there are actually other activities separate from doing tool integration um, that we need to also be thinking about. Um, you know, these are things like threat modeling that can be done regardless of what the SDLC is and regardless of what you're, what you're building. You can do things like threat modeling where you can look at a system as a whole and understand what components are going to be there in the system, uh, identify what the different threat actors are that you would care about for your particular system, whether it's an internal app, external app, mainframe app, mobile app, the threat actors tend to change. Um, then, of course, being able to identify what type of assets you have within your system that you care about protecting, and then looking at your system as a whole and understanding what type of security controls need to be placed where in order to protect your assets from specific threat actors. And it's a very simple exercise that can be done on the whiteboard as part of the software development um, lifecycle before you even write any code, but it tends to add a lot of value and keeping these type of things in mind definitely help, um, you know, reduce the friction and maintain more peace because both the development groups and the security groups get a better appreciation for the challenges that each of them are facing. And they can work together to make their lives easier and ultimately build more secure software from the get-go. Um, so that definitely makes sense. Um, anything you want to add on the training side as well? Um, well, just uh, thinking about things in terms of threat modeling, I think that would be a really valuable exercise to have periodically throughout our life cycle, you know, at the beginning, but then uh, revisiting as we're, you know, uh, coming to the close of, of development, um, you know, getting functionally complete and going back and making sure that the security controls we put in place actually do mitigate the threats that we're anticipating would be intensely valuable. and. The way I've seen it, everything um, so far with static analysis and security tooling in general is about a, a risk-based assessment. And that just never made any sense. You know, you come up with this risk assessment methodology, assign every single asset a number somewhere, and like as soon as the network has completely disappeared um, and everything's bring your own device and there's no clear boundaries, it just seems like uh, a bunch of wasted effort, really. So I like the idea of, you know, putting in place the assets we're protecting and the threat actors that we're protecting those from and coming up with a, a holistic design and um, choice of technologies to, to make sure that we accomplish those. Um, again, I would just harp on the fact that um, training seems to be missing right now from our processes. And as much as possible, I would like the training to be up to date on, you know, the cutting edge technologies that my team wants to use and not just uh, last year's Java framework, but this year's Node and uh, Express and uh, Mongo framework. Um, so uh, I, I would say that training only goes so far, but again, positive reinforcement of what you learned in training, if we could potentially have a tool that um, as we learn up-to-date uh, coding practices helps to reinforce those in a day-to-day -day ongoing basis, that would be ideal. Maybe we wouldn't have to just battle when we come together. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> uh, can anybody help? <laughs> I was going to say, I think you guys are here to help and kind of talk a little bit about, you know, the conflicts that your, your teams face with each other. I don't, I don't think either of you are going to say that there's ever been a perfect harmonious relationship between security and development. But I think by putting on each other's hats and understanding where the, each other are coming from, it makes it a little bit easier to get along. I had a lot of questions come in as you guys have been talking, so I want to start posing some of those to you and, and get those answers out. To, so Ian, the first one we have up, uh, I, I think would be best answered by you, but it's why are security coding practices really just making it into development? Uh, now, I guess, would be the um, yes, uh, now. Why, why finally have, have people started to care about security? Um, I just think that the constant drumbeat of 
uh, loss of data, loss of passwords, everything being broken that you read about um, has finally started to hit home with uh, organizations in general, and that has gotten executives aware that there needs to be some kind of answer to this problem, and it uh, involves developers. Maybe the solution also involves training those developers not to make the same old mistakes that have led to uh, the insecure internet as we know it. Um, better late than never, I would say. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think it's a natural transition we've been seeing over the last uh, more four or five years now where we are having to go at, we're, we're, there's fewer times where we have to go to an organization and educate them as to why thinking about security is important because from the news and all the events that are occurring around us, people have a pretty good grasp as to why security is important. The how do you do security, I guess I'm doing air quotes here, how do you do security is not as easy. And I think organizations are starting to think of more creative ways of integrating security into the development process. And that's why we're seeing more and more things like secure coding standards and uh, building of frameworks that take care of certain security controls and essentially taking the problem of creating security issues away from developers by abstracting out the controls is what we're seeing a lot of people do. And that's why I think we're, we're noticing those more because people are just, you know, getting better at, at building more secure software. Okay, so that, that's great. Something else that has come up from a few different folks here, um, or, you know, whose decision really is it about putting training into both security and development? Is it the department level, level managers? Is it the CEO or CIO? Who should be the one mandating that? Yeah, so from my experience, um, being able to get focus on security, as I kind of mentioned in the beginning of this, uh, this discussion, that it has to be somewhat of a top-down approach. Once you have buy-in from your executives and, and they're mandating that people take training, they will. Um, naturally, we find that people have an appetite for training and they want to do the right thing and learn more, but they're very, they're very much restricted by the amount of time they have available to go and, and invest their time into doing additional training outside of their day jobs. So if it's a top-down approach where you're building a culture where doing training and, and uh, Providing training is important. I think um, people will more proactively take the training that's available to them. And it's also, it's kind of a, a, um, a catch-22. In order to have an effective training program, you have to evangelize the training program and train people to go and know where to go find that training. I find a lot of organizations invest a lot of money into getting um, online computer-based training courses that are at the disposal, disposal of everyone in the firm, but many times people aren't aware that that's even there and at their disposal. So educating and evangelizing training top-down from senior leadership, I think, makes more sense because it can more uniformly um, get the message across the whole organization around what type of training is available and what type of training needs to be focused on. Yeah, the only thing uh, I would add to that is that um, certainly it starts from the top down and really it's the CEO's responsibility to set the business priorities in my view. Um, that needs to be followed through by your CIO and CISO and really all the way down to the department leads are then responsible for ensuring that they carry the torch and get the the budget used for developer training that actually makes sense for the environments that they're programming in. Um, so it certainly starts uh, as high up the chain as the CEO, but it's really everybody's responsibility down to the individual developer to make sure that just because there are resources allocated that they're used efficiently for the benefit of all. I think, I think a lot of organizations, there's a, 
there's a lack of enthusiasm for taking training because I think uh, a lot of the training courses don't necessarily apply to everyone that's kind of required to take that training. Um, so being able to build kind of role-based curriculum where you give people with specific roles specific courses to take that apply to them is important. I think a lot of firms right now tend to get computer-based training just to get use it more as a compliance check. Mm -hmm. that they have training and they spend less time focusing on whether the training truly applies to the people who are taking the, those specific courses. So I think if we can start seeing more of a shift where we are getting more role-based curriculums that apply to different roles at different levels, you know, the same course that you would give to a developer may not be the same course you would give to an architect. Um, and that course may not be the same course that you would give to the office admins. And it's different from the executives and so on. So being able to build that type of a curriculum uh, is important as well. And I think training will be seen in more of a positive light uh, if that was the case than the way it is viewed right now. And Nabil, one of the things I think you just said that was interesting is you mentioned security training for the office admins. I think a lot of time when training is rolled out, it may just be for security or it may be for development, but there's some crazy stat that gets repeated pretty often about the number of attacks that really start uh, from phishing because someone starts clicking a link that they have no idea where it goes to. Ultimately, training, you know, software security is everyone's responsibility at some level or the other. So um, bringing that awareness across the organization is important. And there are certain courses that are very high level. That's probably all that most of the people would need to know unless they're in a more development or architecture or product management role. Let's change tracks a little bit here away from the training. One of the questions is, how do we deal with the need for speed? Development teams are always sort of given short and sprint cycles, and, and how do we build security into that? And we're doing it in process and not waiting until the end. Uh, so I think one of the, the key things, and, and really our mission at Codescope, is that uh, we want to help developers build secure code faster, right? So if you actually have training and that uh, addresses your ongoing concerns of how you're coding that in that day, that sprint, that uh, cycle, then that's part of it. But we really need to cross-pollinate that with tools that reinforce the lessons that we're learning in our training. Um, so yes, everything's about getting uh, everything functionally complete. But if we have tools that, uh, you know, first of all, understand how we're coding, the frameworks that we're using, the libraries that we're using, the job that we're trying to accomplish, and the language that we're using for that. Um, that's, that's a start, but what I really need is a tool that can watch me as I'm coding and only interrupt me when there's something that I should obviously know about, whether that's positive reinforcement, I've just done a good job and put some of my training to use, or I'm about to make a terrible mistake and, you know, uh, this is the right time to address that before it becomes um, ubiquitous throughout the system. So tools that uh, stay out of the way until they're needed and then when they're needed can be used to not only check that you're doing the right thing in this code I'm writing right now, but apply that same rule across all of the code that I've previously written or I'm about to write. Um, that's the key to, in my mind, uh, having training and tooling that accelerates the developer's job rather than hinders it. Okay, so Nabil, this one's probably a good one for you. You know, how do you work with development teams who've lost their confidence in the SAFT results because previous editions of the reports had given that unvetted list of false positives and just a million things? I think, yeah. So. So ultimately, um, it's important, you know, and, and my teams, you know, we hire only people with dev backgrounds. So it's important 
to have the right conversation with the developers. So whenever we do an assessment, we, we kind of insist that we have about a one hour meeting to go over the report, even though the report has only true positives. Um, we still insist we meet with the dev team and the different stakeholders and go over the report itself. And the goal of that meeting is really to put them at ease because we don't go and attack them and tell them here is everything that's wrong. We take it as an approach where we want to have a discussion with them on different remediation techniques. And you know, sometimes they, the solution may be very simple. You know, there could be an instance where you have a few hundred instances of cross-site scripting, but there might be a single point where you could do the right input validation and output encoding that could have prevented that issue. So sometimes the numbers can be pretty daunting and scary for the dev teams if you just hand them a blank report, a, a, just a report with um, all true positives because of the number of instances that get reported. But the fixes may not be that, that scary. So being able to have that open line of communication, reviewing the reports with them, discussing remediation techniques, addressing their concerns, I think helps us be more effective with the development organization uh, and, you know, help them fix the issues much more efficiently than just giving them a report even though it only has true positive issues. Um, we're also always very diligent about following up uh, with the developers. Uh, if they ever have any questions, we have remediation help desk where uh, they can submit a ticket because maybe they didn't work on fixing it right away after that call and they're revisiting an issue and having trouble understanding it. So we do provide remediation help desks as well that give the developers access to the consultants that worked on the assessment so they can still have a, um, a discussion and the person discussing the issue with them has the right context to be able to guide them effectively. All right, and Ian, from your side, how, how do security repair the relationship with you after they've delivered that report? Um, well, uh, communication is key. Um, first of all, telling me that you understand why these false positives came to my desk and that you've done something about it is, you know, an absolute requirement for continuing the conversation. Um, so if, you, if you're vetting, you know, your results and personally um, filtering down things that are, are known false positives, that's okay, but I also want to know that the tools that we're running actually understand my code and it's not just by, you know, looking at every single potential path in the application and then narrowing it down to the ones you happen to know have a vulnerability is the way that this filtered list gets to me. I want to understand that your team has, has chosen products that actually understand JavaScript, actually understand node frameworks, actually understand the stuff that I'm doing today and the languages that I want to be working in tomorrow in order to repair some of the damage done by my 100,000 finding raw results from at scan source that you left me with last year. Perfect. From your perspective, are there tools that are, I, I don't want to say better, but you find giving you better results or you're able to customize to narrow in on those results? And, and, and some folks here are asking particularly about open source tools that can help them with that. It, it's a tough one to find open source static analysis tools that um, do a good job in today's programming paradigms, I would say. Um, so there are very good tools for writing unit tests, and if you craft those correctly, you can have uh, security-related unit tests that um, can help you avoid the most egregious mistakes. Um, but right now, I would say there's a, a, a true lack of um, choices for the languages that I'm most interested in right now, which is JavaScript and is Node. And it just doesn't seem like um, open source vendors or to be truthful, any of the commercial vendors have gotten a grip on JavaScript analysis and how it's different from other, you know, type, strongly typed language static analysis. And uh, so I think that what we've developed at Codescope 
um, will be interesting to those people who want to take another look at static analysis that's not compiler based, that's not based on 20, 30 year old technology. Um, and, uh, you know, whether or not that will ever become an open source project is uh, above my pay grade, but it's certainly free to use, so everybody's, you know, encouraged to check it out right now. Perfect. And we'll do one last question and then we'll let you guys go. I'm sure you have something lined up here at 1 o'clock. Um, but when we talk a bit about design requirements going into the build, are there certain things that you can give guidance on for those user stories of, you know, putting the positives in there and not trying to prove the negative to build the security into the product? Um, I'll, I'll try to answer this, and if, if I'm not, you know, getting to the right answer, please re-ask the question, uh, whoever asked it. But I think um, there's, this, uh, there's this common concept of building user stories where you have use cases and misuse cases. And when you're building the user stories, those tend to come first and those tend to come more naturally based on the features you're trying to implement. And then you can write requirements based on those. But there's an additional piece to that that people don't necessarily always think about and it does require someone with more of a, a malicious thought process to, to do, which is create abuse cases. And let me give you a simple example that might help you understand the difference between the use case, misuse case, and an abuse case. Uh, a use case might be the user enters their username into the username field and their password into the password field. If they match, you authenticate them. The misuse case would be the user types in their username into the user, username field, the password, they fat finger it and they mistype it the first time and you do not authenticate them and give them an error message that allowing them to re-authenticate or try to re-authenticate. The abuse case would be to you type in a username and then type in a wrong password on purpose and then enumerate through different possible combinations of usernames and look at the error message. And if the error message is different uh, based on whether you get the correct username or the wrong username, um, then you can now go through the system and enumerate all valid usernames. And if there happens to be a lockout mechanism, that could then be exploited to lock out all the users of the system and create somewhat of a denial of service scenario. So those are kind of the differences between a use case, a misuse case, and an abuse case. And I think if you can start including the security into those conversations early on, then you can start building the requirements in a way that take care of not only the use case and the misuse case, which you're probably doing right now, but also focus on the abuse cases and build good security requirements that you can actually implement against instead of negative security requirements which says things like don't have cross-site scripting or don't have SQL injection because I don't necessarily think that adds a lot of value. Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely right. The one thing I would add is that to have a, a positive spin on it, if um, you, you have uh, abuse cases, but also the underlying mechanism that's being abused, say authentication or authorization, together with a recommendation of how we want to approach authentication or authorization and particular packages that may meet the needs of developers. Um, that's a way to have uh, less of the negative connotation and more of a uh, positive requirement about, um, you know, making sure you're protected from this particular abuse case using this recommended package, framework, language, et cetera. Thank you so much for that. And, and we'll just kind of wrap up things here. Nabil, Ian, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I thank everybody who's out there for joining us. If you guys have additional questions, there is an email up on the screen that you can email them to, and I'll have Nabil and Ian answer you. And there are also a couple of resources up there you may want to check out. One of them is the tool that Ian referenced that is Codescope's new free beta that is a static analysis tool intended for developers uh, and some other resources by the Civil team. So thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you again at our next session.